Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine Dahoney, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president and CEO of Chorus America. And today I am truly delighted to share some of the work resulting from Chorus America's very first foray into grant making. In 2022, we were presented with a remarkable opportunity to expand access to choral music education for young singers. This resulted in the establishment of the Music Education Partnership Grants. We knew that this opportunity for impact was great, not only for the specific communities receiving funding, but also uh, for the larger field as we could share our learnings. And it's for this reason that Chorus America sought an independent researcher to work with us and the grantees. We were very fortunate to find the talented Dr. Aisha Kasi Chetty, who you will meet in just a minute. She's going to share the findings from some of her research, many of which touch on things that choral leaders intrinsically know to be true. For example, the power that singing has to light up a child and their day, strengthen their engagement to their school and also to their community, or how school partnerships with community-based choruses support larger school goals and provide learning opportunities for teachers and administrators. She'll also touch on some of the systemic challenges in this type of work and just how important sustained funding is in order to fully achieve the goals and potential of these collaborations. Speaking to this last point, I'm also very excited to share that Chorus America will be launching a new request for proposals at the end of this month and will accept applications through November 17th. More on that very soon. Our grants team, Kim and Vale, will be joining us later to share how they've been building some of the learnings from this past grant cycle into the next grant cycle. So first, I would love to introduce Aisha Cassie Chetty. Aisha is a mixed method social scientist with over 10 years of research experience. She currently conducts research and evaluation for DCG Communications, and she previously was the community research manager for the National Humanities Alliance. Aisha's research interests lie in understanding the impact of cultural institutions and practices on marginalized groups. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Cincinnati. She is also a classically trained lyric soprano and collaborative pianist with performance diplomas in piano from Trinity College in London. Aisha's commitment to access, diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with her understanding of music education, has helped create a warm and supportive space to learn about the opportunities and challenges of the last school year for these grant-funded projects. So let me pass it to Dr. Cassie Chetty to share her findings and her report. Aisha? Good afternoon. My name is Aisha Kasichetti, and I'm so glad to be with you all today to share some of the key findings from the impact research for this Music Education Partnership Grants Program. I have loved working on this project over the last year and getting to know all 21 of the grant partners. Today, I am going to present some high-level findings, and I encourage you all to read the full report, which is now available on the Chorus America website. For this impact research, I conducted interviews with all of the grant partners, as well as administered pre and post program surveys. The pre program survey was to understand the organization's hopes for the program, what they needed and what their baseline was. And the post program survey was to understand how the grant helped them implement their projects and if they achieved their desired outcomes. 
Given the short time frame, the participant demographic, and the number of different programs, it was unfortunately not logistically possible to disseminate surveys to students and parents. Survey respondents, therefore, included people who are a part of grantee organizations, both teachers and administrators at schools, and teaching artists. There were 91 responses to the pre-program survey and 64 responses to the post-program survey. All of the organization's projects were aimed at providing choral education opportunities to historically marginalized communities, and nearly all provided musical learning opportunities from cultures around the globe. This took many forms, from students learning directly from guest artists to formal or informal training from music educators. In addition to teaching musicianship and fostering cross-cultural learning, all projects aimed to build community, teach about history and culture, and help students connect with each other. One respondent shared, we hope to demonstrate to administrators, teachers, and students the power of choral music in helping students connect with the content in a way that is meaningful because they see themselves and their culture reflected in what they are learning. It is validating. What we understand, we value. Another said, I hope to see more excitement and engagement in my students with our singing of more diverse cultural repertoire. Lifelong musicians is the ultimate goal. Overall, Responses demonstrate that those involved strongly believed in the power of choral education opportunities to develop essential skills and competencies beyond musical ones. There were both immediate impacts as well as potential long-term impacts of this program. One of the most important and impactful aspects of these projects for students was the diversity of music and teaching artists involved in the various projects. For students, seeing teachers and leaders who looked like them and learning music from their own cultures was hugely impactful and made racially minoritized students feel validated. As one respondent said, my students whose cultural background is Latino was so enthusiastic and excited that their language and culture was represented in the program. They were so proud to share with other chorus students things about their family heritage during rehearsals related to the piece of music that was reflective of them. Clearly, students felt pride in their history and culture because of these experiences. Another impact was how several projects were specifically designed to focus on the community aspect instead of the performative ranging from intergenerational singing programs to ones involving a range of community members. Many of these projects serve to build new relationships and deepen existing bonds. Some projects also aimed to make students feel like valuable and integrated members of their communities. As one respondent said, the songs are deliberately picked out to try to inspire kids that you can use your voice in such a positive way to shift our community you can have a voice in the community. Through learning about other cultures, history, singing the music, and meeting a range of musicians, students gained valuable cultural competence as they learned to appreciate communities and cultures that they would not have crossed paths with otherwise. The way the material was presented made students want to learn more about other cultures. One respondent said, all of the students were very excited to meet a living composer and hear more of the story behind his composition that represented our Native American children in our county. The varied cultures represented through our music made my students want to learn more. This awareness and appreciation for other cultures goes a long way in building stronger and more connected communities, something that we desperately need more of. And this project helped do this. Finally, respondents reported that they saw increased engagement in their students, particularly coming out of a couple of years of isolation and reduced musical experiences. 
this was an incredibly valuable opportunity for many students. As one respondent said, the kids are loving to sing. I have parents tell me my child is singing at home now. Parents and teachers were noticing increased engagement and participation, both inside and outside of the classroom. The grant program also had a significant impact on teachers and schools. One of the ways was through professional development. Many of the programs had aspects built in which either directly provided workshops for teachers, syllabi and other such resources, or where teachers learned through watching and absorbing from the teaching artists who visited their schools. They greatly appreciated the opportunity to learn more about music from other cultures. One respondent said, conductors and teachers often are tentative about performing music from other cultures, given the potential for it feeling or coming across as performative rather than sincere. Having exposure to new works and conversations with living composers allows me to shine the light on these cultures and give my students a genuine connection and understanding of the music we are singing. This is a priceless experience for me and for my students. Music teachers have not all had the opportunity to learn about music from a diverse range of cultures. And these experiences gave them more knowledge and skills in how to teach a wider range of music to their students. This slide shows the impact of the professional development on the teachers and the long term impact it will have on their future students. 100% of teachers said that they would use the knowledge they gained in these projects in the future. 91% said that this experience motivated them to introduce new music to students. 95% said that these projects gave them more confidence to teach a diverse range of music. And 87% said they would encourage students to explore diverse music. So the impacts of these projects will hopefully be long lasting and impact thousands more students. This grant program was also an investment in people and helped with capacity building for many of the grantee organizations. As one said, without this funding, our opportunity to provide our students at the elementary level with a large chorus activity with a renowned conductor would never have happened. We also would not have been given access to instruments, technology items, resources, and diversity materials that this grant has provided. While the funds helped them undertake projects that they would not have otherwise been able to, an important aspect for many was the support they received. As one grantee said, we have received a partnership. I feel supported. I seldom feel supported. I often feel like the weight of the entire program rests on me. The chart on the right shows how the grant money was utilized by partners. As you can see, 85% of grantee organizations used at least a portion of the funds to pay teaching artists and personnel. Others used the funds for a range of items, including food, sheet music, transportation, and other supplies, all of which was so necessary to successfully carrying out these projects. While this program was very successful in many ways, grantee organizations, of course, faced challenges along the way. Some of these challenges are logistical and others are larger scale problems. For example, several grantee organizations spoke of the transportation barrier that many of their students faced. This issue becomes a problem for any after school or weekend events because then to make it equitable and accessible to all students, either everything has to be planned for within school hours or transportation has to be arranged. As one respondent said, the transportation issue is huge, especially here because our public transportation system leaves a lot to be desired. 
And there's that added pressure if a parent has to have multiple jobs and are possibly taking care of kids, even younger than the kids that are coming to our lessons or going to the schools that we work with. This is definitely something to plan for in the future when initially considering different types of projects that one wants to implement and the locations and the timings of these projects. Several partner organizations found it difficult to navigate the logistical issue of scheduling with schools because of how complex school schedules are. One respondent said, the biggest hurdle has been scheduling, getting our schedules to coordinate with the school year schedules, plus the teacher schedules, plus coordinating, sometimes nine musicians on our end, plus the school, has taken a lot more administrative time than we realized when we were first imagining this project. While not always possible, as grant partners found, planning ahead is key to overcoming such scheduling challenges. Finally, teacher retention in schools is a huge problem around the country. Teachers in general, and music teachers in particular, are underpaid and overworked, and demands on teachers have been exacerbated in the last few years. High turnover and teacher burnout naturally has negative impacts on students. One respondent said, statewide, we're seeing huge turnovers. There's a teacher retention and recruitment crisis. That is pretty significant. It's a real issue we're facing. While this is not something grantee organizations can directly do anything about, their support in these schools means that teachers have a lower burden and this has a positive impact on students' experiences as well. Looking to the future, there is a tremendous need for more resources for music education as a whole. The grantee organizations were able to do amazing work in partnership with the schools. However, continued funding is required to keep this work going. This work can also be very isolating. And as grantee organizations found this year, networks and relationships help tremendously. Shared ideas and commiserating can make one feel less isolated in this extremely important work. On a larger scale, many grant partners expressed that there needs to be a cultural shift to valuing music and arts more, so that more state, local, and federal resources will be allocated to music education. This is a larger problem and one that all of these grantee organizations in their own ways are trying to address. And now let's hear from the grant partners themselves and get a glimpse into some of the different projects and see some of the impact that they've had on so many students. Singing together opens your heart, it stimulates your brain, and it brings you closer to other people. It opens your heart to their humanity, and I think it makes us all better humans. Border Crossing is an umbrella choir based in the Twin Cities. This grant funded a partnership that we had with four different elementary schools in town. We're a program that brings together newcomer, refugee, and indigenous youth to teach indigenous culture um, from indigenous leaders to the youth. Um, they're hand drumming and singing and connecting cross-culturally. <laughs> We recognized there was no music program, and so that's what this grant was about, was could we bring a music program to the school for the mothers, the teachers, and the babies. It's a program where the moms and the babies can go to school at the same site. The babies smile, the mom loves it. They get to pick up the child from the child care and bring them into the parenting room. When we saw the possibilities of this grant, we thought, is there a way we can get these composers to come into schools and to bring not only their music, but music of their cultural background? Our project was to bring in culture-bearing singing masters to work with elementary school students in grades three through five. Sing on, sing on. We 
received a uh, partnership grant um, from Chorus America to provide additional chorus opportunities to our students after school. We wanted to provide choir to our students in our K-8 um, elementary school district. We run school partnership programs in schools where there's not a choral program. We also launched a very exciting collaboration with the Tahona Adam Nation, which is one of the indigenous nations in Tucson. We are the only music program on the Tahona Adam Nation. Chorus of America has helped to fund our Roots of Music program, known as ROMP. And this is a music foundation that brings this opportunity to third and fourth grade students. The majority of our students are from the Latinx community. They get so excited because they have this culturally relevant moment of getting to see music that represents a lot of their cultures. A lot more, feel more connected to their family and their traditions and they're wanting to know more about where they came from. So because of our program, we are able to harness that and give them that little spark. We have, because of this project, started both a children's and a youth choir. Children are now singing these songs from other cultures and playing the games that they learned on the playground in like a completely organic way. The students had a place to belong and um, you know, they were excited about every Wednesday, yay, we have, you know, we have chorus, I'm in a chorus group, I'm going to perform. One of the students looked around at her friends and said, I'm going to get his autograph. And all the other kids said, I'm going to get his autograph. To see these students have an idea that they could have that creativity themselves, it's not some genius thing that you're born with, everybody can do that. We have an educational program that is ours, that is run with our mission, that targets the neighborhoods that we work in. This grant allowed us to purchase instruments, allowed us to bring guest artists, allowed us to organize concerts. They're connecting to indigenous drumming and singing, and they're linking it to their own experience. And you see and you feel the connection that people have. I'm seeing people beginning to sing and, and make beautiful sounds together. We're going to have graduation, and the whole school has been invited to sing Count on Me, Whitney Houston style. And this has never happened the 13 years I've been there, to have someone that's graduating to actually be singing in a choir and performing at graduation. It was so impactful to bring in these artists from various cultures and the fact that they would remember a phrase in Ukrainian for like months signals to me that it has made an impact on their life and it's uh, something they'll remember for the rest of their lives. A lot of our students have been struggling with mental health issues. Some of them have been struggling with uh, drug use and now I see a smile on their faces and see that they have hope. Every single thing we do at one school, we've been able to take elsewhere. The sheet music that we created for that curriculum, the teaching videos, the instruments, the performances, other teachers are hearing about it and taking it and using it in their own classrooms. They're sharing with each other about their identity, their family identity, their cultural identity. What it's bringing forth is a level of comfort with each other and familiarity with each other that they haven't experienced in their choir class. We were able to have our composers in 11 different schools and reach over a thousand students. Having funding to be able to bring that back for students creates the kind of community that we need so much. That shift that you get to see and their eyes just brighten up because they're like, whoa! You know, they kind of like sit up a little bit more and they get that posture and they're like, I know this song, I've heard it before. But having the conversation of the meaning of it was very powerful. Supporting the arts in schools is essential. It is the thing that will have the most impact on our society in the future. Everything that we're able to do to help kids of all ages to make music together with each other is such a beautiful opportunity for growth, for their humanity, to grow up and be better humans.
Well, that's just so much fun. Uh, <laughs> there's no better way than just starting with Lead with Love with Melanie Damore. And that was the Phoenix Chamber Choir um, out in Vancouver and their work with Melanie on their funded project, the Phoenix Choral Experience. Um, I am so glad that we had an opportunity to hear from Grant Partners and Aisha today, which Aisha, I just need to say that we have so enjoyed working and collaborating with you throughout this last school year. And I just wanna thank you for creating such a wonderful environment to share impact and for capturing uh, these findings so beautifully in this report, which I encourage everyone to spend more time with later if you can. Um, today, we only had time for really the high level summaries, but the full report is available on our website. Dale, thank you for adding that to the chat. And our hope is that you can download that, take a look at it and use it as a tool for making the case for increased investment in choral music education within your own community. Um, also for those of you I have not met yet, my name is Kim Theodore Seide. I have the pleasure of facilitating our grants work along with my colleague Vale. Um, and we make up the grants team at Chorus America, which as Catherine mentioned earlier, is a relatively new area of work for our organization and why we've been eager to learn from it. And this report really reinforces much of what we've learned this past year, which is that there's a real need for multi-year support for music education. Mm. Um, and I am so grateful to say, um, and just very excited to share that thanks to a continued partnership with the Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, Chorus America will be providing additional grant funding to our current grant partners during this school year. So sustaining their work for two full years to continue that um, impact in their communities. But in addition, this fall, we're also launching a new request for proposals proposals um, or RFP to support partnerships between choruses and schools during the next two upcoming school years. So these grants would support work during the 24, 25 and 25, six school years. And Vail, would you mind sharing more information about that new RFP? Yes, thank you, Kim. I'd be happy to. Um, and thank you for uh, Casey for sharing some slides as I as I share this info. Um, so this fall, the grants team is offering two different grant opportunities for those serving children and youth, the first being the music education grants that Kim's uh, mentioned. In addition, we're also transitioning the Dale Worland Singers Commission Award into a grant. Um, we encourage you to visit our grants website to learn more about each opportunity. Each grant program has different eligibility requirements and priorities. Um, we will actually be hosting a more in-depth webinar on application requirements and how grants will be reviewed later in October. But today I'm happy to go over some of the important dates and eligibility requirements of each program. We'll start first uh, with the Music Education Partnership Grants. Like the previous grant cycle, this opportunity is available to organizations serving specific geographical regions. So we encourage you to review the website to make sure your organization is eligible to apply. In this grant cycle, we will be accepting applications from nonprofit organizations or fiscally sponsored projects only. Um, grants of up to $50,000 over two years, so $25,000 each year, uh, will be offered. More details, including the full grant guidelines, as well as how to set up a meeting with staff, are available on our website. One important change I want to note from previous years is that this grant now funds work serving students as young as early childhood through 12th grade. Uh, previously, this program was limited to elementary, middle, and junior high grades. The application portal will open on October 2nd, and applications will be due on November 17th. In partnership with the American Composers Forum, we'll also be offering the Dale Worland Singers Commission Grant, which is a $10,000 grant to support an artistically meaningful and mutually beneficial collaboration with a composer on a new work for the choral repertoire. This grant cycle, we will be accepting applications from children and youth choruses. There are no geographical or regional requirements, um, but past recipients since 2015 are not eligible to apply. Again, for more details, including the full grant guidelines, um, those are all available on our website. The application portal for this grant opportunity will also open on October 2nd, and applications will be due on November 17th. To support applicants, the grants team is happy to meet with you to discuss your proposed project. Um, there is a link for you to set up a meeting with Kim or I on our grants website. 
Um, our team, as I mentioned, will also be hosting a webinar on October 18th to go over specific application requirements and the review process in much more detail. Um, I believe Kim's going to drop the link to register for that in the chat. So if you're interested in getting more information, please do that. Yep, just put that in the chat, um, Vale. And um, if you are considering applying during the next RFP, I hope you will make time for that webinar. That's really when we're going to go through the specific requirements of um, applying for each grant opportunity in a lot more detail. Um, and that's also when we'll have an opportunity to really um, do a more thorough Q&A. I see some questions coming in. We'll try to do our best to address some of the questions that we see and follow up with you all afterwards. Um, but we will have a dedicated Q&A during that webinar. Um, in the meantime, I really do encourage you to visit our website. Um, whether you plan on applying to one or both of these programs, we've just recently posted all of the guidelines for each grant program. So this is a really great place to start. It's chock full of information. Um, and as you're making your way through that, those websites too, um, one thing I want to point your attention to is a resource that we've made available for both the Dale Warland opportunity and also the Meet the Music Education Partnership Grants Opportunity, which is the application toolkit. This is a Word doc that includes all the application requirements and questions. That way you can start working on it before the portal opens on October 2nd. It's also really handy because then you've got that Word doc that you can already cut and paste from once the portal opens um, so you can begin working on your submission. Um, if after you've had a chance to review our website, you still have questions, like Vail mentioned, there is that link on the FAQ section where you can schedule a time to talk with a staff member. And then, of course, there's also the webinar on October 18th, too. Also, if you're not planning on applying but want to become more involved in our grants work, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, we've begun accepting self-nominations for panelists. And um, if you're interested in learning more about what that entails, the, the dates, the responsibilities, and the honoraria that we offer to all panelists for their service. Um, you can find out more information about that in um, the, the grant panelist nomination link that Vail just posted. There's more information about all of that, but we would love to have um, folks join us in that work. It's a really um, wonderful and rich way to become involved in our grants work. Um, again, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, please feel free to share this report and these opportunities, and especially that November 17th deadline um, with your teams and colleagues. Again, thank you for joining us and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>